Welcome to Never Rewrite. I'm Isaac Askew. And I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And today we are joined by special guest Brian Beggy to talk about the transformation uh, of a company from internal software to the uh, SaaS model. Uh, Brian, why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners? Uh, sure. So my name is Brian Beggy. I'm a uh, senior software architect, uh, staff engineer level. Uh, I've been banging around the industry for about uh, 20 years now. Uh, in with more or less success in a number of places. Yes, and we I was at a place where we had more and then less success. <laughs> they, they tend to go, go, go together. They go well separated. and then they don't. <laughs> separated by time. Yes. Um, so I, wanted, I asked you to come on because uh, I wanted to talk uh, to you because I know you've been involved in two or three companies that transition from, hey, we have software that runs our business to we want to package up and sell this software so other people can run similar businesses. Uh, and I wanted to talk through, you know, kind of how that went, like, because it's a changing business model. It's from we're going to be a X to we're going to help other people be X. And also how the software transform went or didn't go and lessons learned. Sure. Um, so it's a super interesting uh, pro sort of project to get involved in. Um, and I've never seen it succeed. So um, I guess the lesson <laughs> of this is, um, for the most part, it is just not possible to change an organization's DNA to that degree in a way that I've seen it happen. Um, Interesting. So did the software migration part not work or the company didn't change enough to make it? It, it was the latter, right? The companies, okay. in, in no case could the company let go of their previous identity and their previous way of doing things well enough to build a product for cu for customers. Um, because you're, you're talking about switching basically from being a B2C customer or, or where C might be defined as another business organization, but it's not a peer, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to being a B2B company where your customers are suddenly people who otherwise would have been your peers. Um, and I, I've seen... It's possible to to start to succeed in this, at least if your business is not particularly idiosyncratic, um, where everybody is doing the same thing. I can see where this might work, um, but it strikes me that it's that in many cases um, the problem is every customer's needs are a little bit different. They're certainly different from yours as a trailblazer in automating this industry. Mm. Um, and as a result, you're just not well prepared to make that jump. Um, and it, it's part of it is, is um, a change in where decisions get made. You start having people like product managers and product owners who are responsible for making sure you're building something your customers love. As opposed to your previous incarnation in which you just needed to see, serve your B2C customers and their opinions were, they, they were very different than what you have when you're trying to sell the business. Let's, uh, maybe we, we go for a concrete example. Sure. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think one of them, you were working at a, like, um, auto collision or auto repair. Yeah, I was in the insurance space. Okay, so it was insurance. So somebody, mm -hmm. this was software where somebody has crashed their car or had an accident. Yep. And they need to take pictures and then yep. the insurance company needs it. Yep. And it worked, it worked great. And that's why everybody wanted it. Okay. So their software worked really well. So, but you were working for an actual insurance company or this was a company that was contracted it, to an insurance company? It was a company that was contracted to insurance companies. And then they wanted to get out of the business of servicing mm -hmm. and go from being the kind of margins you have where you've got humans doing work enabled by software to the kind of margins where you're selling software that scales in, you know, the sales scale infinitely. You can sell as many widgets as you want because it's just a license mm -hmm. um, and a little hosting costs. Um, and the challenge is that organizations are very different. So if you, you go to decide to get into bed with a giant insurance company and they're going to operate your software, you suddenly have all of their business processes, which may not be yours. Mm -hmm. um, you're integrated much deeper. You're not like a, an arm's length service provider for them anyway, anymore. Um, you need to be deeply integrated in what they're doing and you need them to be a much higher degree of partner than perhaps they were before. Wow. Um, okay. 
So they were they were selling insurance. They were selling software, or they were licensed software for insurance companies, and they did they managed the, the software. So they were providing a service to the insurance. They provided companies. a service to the insurance companies. They would manage and, the claim for you. Okay. And they Perfect. wanted to switch to they would provide the service, the software to the insurance company. Yeah. Yeah. So you it's, no longer need an army of people, right? You need right. doing work. You need a smaller army of engineers building software that enables people on other people's payroll to do the work. Interesting. Um, now, I can't speak to whether it eventually succeeded. Um, I honestly didn't try that long before I said, okay, this isn't for me. Um, and mm. there was a, another opportunity available that was a lot closer to what I'm good at. Um, so in, in this particular case, um, there were a number of things that that were challenging. One of them was um, suddenly interfacing with your uh, a deeper integration with business partners where there's more of their process involved. Um, a change from being, we only care about the B2C end user customer to all of a sudden the, the B2B, you know, the business customer is more important and we have to listen to them. Well, um, you would no longer be t dealing with the consumer, right? So no, originally you would be the, the person who had the accident and you're collecting their information. You want to make sure that they're having a good experience. And then there's some integration with the insurance yeah. company. Now it's, you're only talking to the insurance company. You never talk to the customer. You never talk to the customer. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you're, um, you're more deeply tied into their organization um, because they're, the contact is much greater, right? You're, mm -hmm. um, you're no longer an adapter that they use to interact with customers. You're deeply embedded into their processes. Um, so, you, you know, you're going from being a third party module to being a, a service in their ecosystem. Mm. Uh, and that's a pretty when, challenging transition. Whenever, when you say uh, at one point the the job is no longer kind of for you, was that because of that transition? Um, no, it was it was more around. Um, I want to do things that are more engaged with what cust and customers. Um, and having grown up being able to make all of the decisions. I think the organization wasn't really prepared for a world in which product managers and product owners had a role. Mm. Um, now, I'm not a product owner; I'm an engineer. But I, you know, um, I find the value in what product managers and product owners do to be there and to be very important. Um, so, a lot of the decisions that leave came from uh, questions of where decisions were getting made. That. Mm -hmm. Customer-centric decisions were getting made by engineering leadership. Um, architectural decisions were being made by engineering leadership. And that was kind of, that was the big red flag. Um, and then there was another opportunity for an org that was uh, much smaller, much uh, earlier in its work. Um, and with much, a number of, of challenges that fit really well with what I was, I'm pretty good at. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a much better fit and, and somebody at that organization I'd worked with before, uh, took me out to lunch and, and gave me the sales pitch, uh, at <laughs> which point I said, well, okay, I'm not enjoying this. I don't see in the short run, how you make this transition without a big DNA change in the org. That's going to be hard. Right. And it's going to be rocky and it may take three or four years. And I don't really have three or four years for this to start getting good. Hmm. So an interesting thing that I think you're saying, but I'm not, I want to clarify, make sure the actual, did you have to do a lot of work transitioning the software from the, we are running the company to, we are a SaaS? No, you're going to love this. The software was a big rewrite oh. in order to target the SaaS customer. Um, so the effort was a, we have got an existing application stack. We don't have very much confidence in it because it's sort of a 1990, or sorry, 2005, 2009, 2010 Ruby on Rails stack. So what year was uh, the rewrite? Or what year uh, this was, was 2018. Transition? Okay, so at least eight to 10 year old Ruby code. Yeah, it was, it was somewhere in that range. And it was, it looked like Ruby code from 2009, right? 
Um, so you can think about like, so I, I have kind of strong opinions on Ruby on Rails. I think it's a fantastic tool if your goal is to create technical debt as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> um, because it, the happy path it leads you down is the big ball of mud, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are organizations and I've seen it and I've, I've talked to a couple of people who, who've done this. Um, Root Insurance is one that jumps out as, as an organization that has imposed some discipline on the Ruby stack in a way that is not immediately obvious until you've kind of looked at it a little longer. I, I had a couple conversations with them a couple of years ago um, and I was impressed. Um, uh, in order to make, to get the kind of modularity you want in software without building totally separate microservices, right? Which is a whole other topic related to, you know, whether you can use Lambda this this week's news story about Lambda versus microservices, the AWS <laughs> yeah. conversation that everybody's talking about. Sorry, future listeners, um, Google it. Um, Rails will lead you down a path if you're not careful of being a giant ball of mud. So faced with that challenge, the org said, well, we will build a new system. In Ruby? In Ruby on Rails. And then here is the part that that kind of made me say, okay, this is not for me. We're going to do exactly the same things we did before. Okay. Mm. Because um, those are the patterns we like, and those are the patterns we think were good. And only a fool would build a microservice architecture. We want to build another monolith. You know, and that's when I was out. Right? <laughs> um, so got it. Mm. Um, I disagreed with that decision at the time. I thought it was a mistake. I may have been right or wrong. I don't know. And I didn't stick around to find out. Um, so on top of those challenges, there's a big rewrite going on. Mm. I didn't um, realize there was a rewrite going on on top of all that. Yeah, it was the the effort was, we're okay, we, we built this thing for our internal use and we can't maintain it anymore. We can't move it to the next level because it is such a Ruby ball. You know, we've got, you know, magic monkey patch things happening at runtime. You know, nobody knows what this thing is doing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's the the criticism I've got of, of Rails is that it lends you to that kind of thing. Um, that sounds like the criticism of PHP, which is it, it will let yeah. you shoot yourself in the foot really <laughs> yeah. easily. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the basic, you know, the basic way the Ruby uh, sidearm is designed is the barrel points at you, um, right? And if you're careful, you can not shoot yourself with it but um now there are probably places where you want that I, it's ideal if you want to start a startup you want to knock something out very quickly you want to sell it to somebody else and you want to make it their problem oh fantastic <laughs> right um but um if you own one of these things you've got a real maintenance challenge unless your developers were incredibly far-sighted to, to put yourself up in a good position. So um, it was a big rewrite on top of it. So we could, you know, we can see the strikes accumulating where it was like, okay, this is a hard corporate DNA change. It's going to take some really inspired leadership. Um, I don't like how engineering decisions are being made, particularly architectural decisions coming from executives. Um, three, it's in this, this technical stack that I think lends itself to big ball of mud. Four, it's a big rewrite. Five, they're not even letting me build microservices to do this thing. Um, so I, I, these are, it's the challenge. It's just simply too challenging for a lot of orgs, I think. Was the company intending, while you were there at least, for the rewrite, were they using it, the rewrite internally on their own stuff while they were, so, or is it going to be running entirely separate? That is the external facing version uh, right um so it, it involved a, a bunch of interfacing with an external insurance company a gigantic european monolith insurance company um that had processes and so it, it, on top of it you've got kind of american startup culture world where you move fast and you sometimes break things up against you know giant fintech insurance which is pretty conservative. Oh, and did we mention they're in Europe too? So the cultural difference of how, how we are willing to work with data, how you're willing to work with people's information is very, very different. So it was things like, 
um, we're supposed to build a database, a data integration of some kind, and you're only allowed to connect to their development database by using a particular laptop and a power adapter because the thing came from Ireland sure. with a VPN software that was six versions behind and didn't work with most of your browsers. Have fun. So I mean, <laughs> I, 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 on, on top of it, it was stuff like that where, you know, there's a reason startup people sneer at the, you know, these large established companies. And I think enterprise this was software is enter yeah, it, it, this was, I think a hundred year old insurance company. Um, so on top of all, like, so the, the challenges piled up. So any one of these challenges, like if you could cut the, the challenge down to a reasonable size and say, Hey, we're going to change the company's DNA and we're going to do it without a big rewrite. We're going to do it incrementally. We're going to do it with customers who really get us and are, we're mm -hmm. on the same vibe. Uh, and we're going to do it with with people who are flexible in what they want to do and people who are willing to delegate decisions to the most appropriate level, i.e. Your, your staff engineers make your technical decisions, your executives give them cover and make the strategic decisions, you know, that kind of thing. Anyone, like if you took it took the challenges away, you'd you might get to something where it is possible to succeed yeah. at this. Um, I guess hindsight's probably 2020 here, but... I bet it's kind of hard in the moment to not think, wow, these these folks are going down uh, and almost intentionally picking the worst, most expensive, clunky, slow process imaginable. Like, do they want it to <laughs> succeed at this point? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, I think for a lot, it was the first time they'd failed at a software project, too. So mm. I don't think they saw like, mm. okay, they're, all of the warning signs are here, guys. This is not right. going to work. Um, and, and that's a that's a challenging thing to to be on your first and say, okay, this, this isn't going to happen. Um, I guess they were so confident from from winning. <laughs> well, yeah, because if you won, and and they did win in the in the B two C space, like they were right. doing great. Um, the challenges were more around, well, we see this other opportunity we want to move to and underestimating the amount of change that was going to be required. Um, and, and some of this is probably like the, the things that got you here aren't going to get you to the next step. Right. And I'm going to like the same vein of like a toxic positivity where everyone's like, no, man, we've got this. We can do it. We can do anything. And then you're like, no, it, it's changed a bit from last iteration. <laughs> this is a bigger ask than you, you're thinking you're asking. Mm hmm. Do you think the fact that they didn't have, like that they were they were successful running the, the software themselves, and it sounded like they were going to continue to run the software themselves for a you know an infinite amount of time, right? They weren't yeah. planning to stop. Do you think that undercut the model as well, where the fact that they could always fall back to like they weren't burning the ships, they weren't saying we are getting out of running yeah. our software and we are going to only sell it. Uh, do you think that also undermined the project? Um, I, I think you'd, you'd have to keep that in mind, right? Um, because the fallback would always be, well, we did this over here and it works for us. Mm. And okay, well, the problem is that you don't own the whole problem anymore. You only own a part of the problem. So you have to think in terms of, um, you know, your, your customer info provider has got to be a different, it's got to be firewalled off from the rest of your data. Mm -hmm. Because it's coming from somebody else's source, like it's some DB2 system that you're getting customer data out of. You don't own that. It's not your, and it was, this was a MySQL shop. Um, it's not your own MySQL database. You need to think about boundaries in your system in ways that you haven't had to before. Um, and I think that goes to back to like, well, monoliths were good enough for us when I wrote monoliths in 2009. So therefore, as an exec, now I'm going to make you build monoliths because that's good in how you build software. And I, I think there was a culture clash between those of us who came in out of microservice world and were like, yeah, obviously, this thing is like 10 different services um, because you're going to interact with third parties and your, you know, your rates engine or, or your, that's actually not, not the right problem they're trying to solve, but your, you know, your coverage engine, you should assume your coverage engine is going to be somebody, some other service that is going to be independent from your customer in customer database. So you have to think about that in advance, right? Um, 
Otherwise, you get you know foolishness like trying to extract data from one, push it into another monolithic system, and then keep them in sync or, or stuff yeah, like that, yeah. which is, yeah, ex exactly. You don't want to do that. You can avoid it. Um, so I think there are a bunch of success that happened in monolithic applications where we control the whole thing, where we, you know, we are the owners of the business, we are the owners of the, this problem space, had been successful. And then you bring that over to, okay, you're not the owner of the problem space anymore. Um, you don't own all the parts of this thing. You've got to play friendly. You've got to think about separation of concerns very early. And then on top of it, like your technology stack you've chosen lends itself to big ball of mud. Um, that's where, you know, I said, this is never going to work. So it's time to, mm -hmm. you know, it's time to, it's time to give somebody else a try to do this and maybe they will succeed and maybe they won't. Right. Did, was there another case uh, another time that you, you were in a project that was a SaaS um, conversion? Yeah, er, earlier I worked for a, a, a company that um, was in um, warehouse management. This was a, a customer of mine when I was a consultant. Um, and they were doing basically a, a point of sale type system for unloading of trucks, um, which is an industry I had no idea exists. Tr uh, truck drivers don't actually unload their own trucks. The warehouse company doesn't actually unload their own trucks. There are third party contractors in the middle who do this stuff. Um, and truck drivers hate them because they have to pay them and, and warehouse people hate them because they're not under their, you know, they, their, their independence, uh, who can kind of mess up your operation if they do it wrong. So it's this weird little niche business. Um, and I'd worked with a company that, that was in this business and built them some software that let them give them some visibility into all of their, the locations they were at, they were at a half dozen places. Um, and it was just, you know, kept them made sure that the people on on the job were doing the right thing. And this was this was 15 years ago. So the, the tech was pretty uh was pretty rough. Um this is before smart well not this is, before smartphones, but yeah smartphones were smartphones. mostly before smartphones. So these things were desktop computers um on them were that we would uh were required to do things like print invoices to hand to truckers so that truckers can be mm. reimbursed and stuff like that. Um and sometimes it was over dial up modems. So it had to, you know, do stuff like work offline and then sync its work at night. Um, this is, you know, dark ages technology stuff. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the environments were filthy and, and rough and, and uh, anyway, so, you know, this was, this was the business they were in. And it, it was a matter of going to basically their competitors and saying, hey, these guys that you think of as a competitor are actually going to become your vendor. And if we all kind of split this up, uh, or if we all kind of uh, use our software, you're going to make a bunch more money. And that was really more of a sales problem than anything, um, mm -hmm. where like that pitch was not compelling. These were not technologically sophisticated customers or, or technologically sophisticated businesses. There were really only a couple of people who saw what this could do. And it was pre the ubiquity of mobile computing that we have today, where if you were going to go build this today, you'd be like, yeah, it's a smartphone app. And, you know, you'd install it on your your machine and you take a picture of the truck's number on the side of the truck and you click the button and it sends them an email um, with a link to a download an invoice if that's what you need. Um, so, right. you know, that was a, a challenge more for the, the sales side of things that never really got off the ground was around like, how do we convince our, our, our competitors that this is, you want to get, you want to get with us and get involved with us and we will help you make more money too. Um, so it sounds like in that case, the problem was, well, parts of the problem, they were still rerunning, they were still going to be running the business. So they were going to be a competitor. Yep. Um, certainly it was, you know, earlier in the technology that made this possible. So it was hard to make the value. Yeah. The value obvious. was less clear. It was less obvious why you would want this. Um, since you had written the software though, they didn't need to do a rewrite. No, it was, um, we knew it <laughs> from the start that uh, it would be possible for locations to have different owners and that you'd need to segment your users and things like that by owner. So built mm -hmm. it multi-tenant from the start. Hmm. Um, so that was, it was not a technical challenge. It was really more of a, a sales challenge. And then at some point, had they been successful, then it would have turned into a technical challenge where we would have to think, uh, or, or a, a software product challenge around um how do we make the features that our customers want that are distinct from the needs of running our internal business 
and how do we develop things that are competitive, possibly competitive advantages for us without also handing those advantages to people who are competitors. Right. Um, or, like or it's, a, yeah. You'd have to get out of the business. Exactly. And that was the next sentence was like, or you get out of that business and you say, no, we're a, we're software now. We're not, we're not logistics. I wanted to go because you and I were involved in what was sort of a third incident. Yeah, it was a sort of a third instance of this. So and that it, was good. Uh, I was gonna say it was interesting because it wasn't a it wasn't a SaaS model, it was a franchise model. Where we worked for a company that has their name on a baseball stadium, and <laughs> it they they had their software and they bought a effectively they bought a competing company. And they turned it into a franchise. And so they, we, well, simply, wasn't simple, but we, but the, what we actually did is we just created a second AWS account. We installed all the software and we said, okay, now there's two instances. And, you know, the corporate did their corporation dancing stuff. And, you know, there was now a holding company that owned the original company and the now second company. And okay, it's a service. And now I think they've done three or four of them. So kind of the franchise set. Yeah. But and they're not really was, a SaaS though. Well, that was my comment about um, earlier about uh, an industry that is all the same, right? Mm. Because if you're in something like residential lending, the business processes are remarkably similar from lender to lender because the regulatory environment is so significant. Um, it is less like this is how we do it and more how this is how we keep the government from destroying us if, <laughs> because we have to follow all of their complicated rules. So right. there's a chunk of this that's going to be the same no matter how you do this thing. Everybody's got, you know, the same reporting requirements. Everybody's got the same um, risk requirements. Everybody's got the same underwriting requirements. They all sell to the same banks to unload these, these loans. Um, all of that's going to be the same. So that, you know, that strikes me as a place where, okay, well, you could succeed at that. Um, the challenge, again, would be around um, differentiating the services business from the SaaS business. If those are really confusing terms. What the, you know, the operational business and its needs from the, the needs of selling SaaS to where you can innovate in one without innovating in the other, or you innovate differently in the other Um the the technical side of that of just standing up another stack certainly achieved that but i don't think in that case there was the product vision being articulated around well how are these products different how how does what we do internally differ from the saas offer well i don't think they did in that case because it was a pure franchise play yeah so it was the, a pure franchise play you're right the the new company like the the new purchased company had to adopt Oh, it'd be like if yeah. McDonald's bought a Burger King and it's like, okay, well now you're McDonald's. Yeah. You know, you, you were doing something similar because you were Burger King, but now, now you're McDonald's and you're going to do everything the McDonald's way. Yeah. Which that strikes me as a successful way to go from being, um, working, you know, the old saw about working in the business to working on the business, right? That the franchise model is the classic work on the business where you build a machine and then you let other pe people rent the machine to make money. Um, that strikes me as somewhere where you can, you can, it's, but it's less of a SaaS play at that point, right? It's more about, you can also operate our business machine, not we're going to sell you a component of that business machine. Mm. Right. Cause the, the former example back in insurance world was we've got this machine. We're going to sell you a component of that machine and, and we'll rent it to you. Mm -hmm. and you can use it for in your business. The franchise model is we're going to rent you this machine and you can plug people into it and marketing dollars and branding and stuff like that. Right, well, and franchise they, is a full business. Yeah, it's a full business. Yeah, exactly. It's a full business ready to go. So like that strikes me as the, the model where this does work, right? Where if you've got a successful software enabled business, don't go into SaaS, franchise it. Hmm. Hmm. I think that's a great place to leave it because it that's like a high note right there. We've right got, there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's 
the transition from if running a company to you know the idea that you're going to take your company and you're going to take the software that you use to run your company and turn that into a SaaS seemingly doesn't work because you're competing with your potential customers and you, the processes in your DNA, your company's DNA are going to be different than other people's. Right? You're not, it's not a service play, but yeah. you could do it as a franchise play where you're saying you're going to do it our way and our software works exactly right for the way we do it. Yeah. You, you add people. We're not a service. We're a franchise. You add people to our, to our thing and turn cranks and it makes money. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you for coming on, oh, Brian. Thank you. This was great. Uh, if people want to get in contact with you and tell you that you're right or wrong <laughs> and have an argument on the internet. for as... <laughs> Oh, those are the most useful things to do. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, findable on the internet. Uh, just Google my name and, you, and you'll probably find me. Uh, I don't have a blog or a SoundCloud to promote, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> are, are SoundCloud still a thing? I believe yeah. they I believe they are, but only ironically. So I, I don't know. I I, <laughs> I think that's a, a piece I just missed. So um, right. yeah. So uh I don't have a SoundCloud to to, to uh promote, but uh you know, be nice to animals, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for listening. Like I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And I'm Isaac Askew, and this is never rewrite.